Hi everyone, this is your podcast host Avi. I'm currently a final year student at Monash University of Malaysia. And today we are with our guest, Dr. Joseph Go. All right. Hi, Dr. Joseph. Hello, Avi. Thanks Hi. for having me. Yep. Let me just do a little introduction for Dr. Joseph, for those of you who may not know who he is. Um, born into a family of mixed ancestry in Sarawak, Malaysia, Dr. Joseph Go, his formative years were marked by weekend picnics in the country, midnight masses, English novels, and sophisticated singles. In 2010, Dr. Go earned two graduate degrees from the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University in California, USA. Dr. Go is interested in issues of gender, sexuality, and sexual health within the larger framework of human rights. As a theological activist, he enjoys writing on the issues of religion and theology, particularly in their intersections with LGBTIQ subjectivities. All right, Dr. Go, um, let me just quickly mention a few of the publications that he has also put out. Um, these are two of his books that I will be mentioning. One of them is titled Doing Church at the Amplify Open and Affirming Conferences. Queer, how do we pronounce this, Dr. Go? Ecclesiologies. There we go, okay. In Asia. And the second one being Gender and Sexuality Justice in Asia, Finding Resolutions Through Conflicts. And we also have another one titled Becoming a Malaysian Trans Man, Gender, Society, Body and Faith. All right. Now, moving on to our questions for you today, Dr. Go. Um, first of all, I would just like to ask you, what is the main theme of your research in LGBTQIA plus issues in the past 10 years? I think that many scholars around Asia and beyond Asia are doing a lot of studies and research on LGBTIQA plus people mm -hmm. in various ways. Some take... Um, approaches that are very different to mine. Uh, we see a lot of, uh, especially in East Asia, we see a lot of LGBTIQA plus uh, studies uh, in terms of uh, film analysis. But I take a social science uh, approach where I am very interested in the lived experiences of uh, LGBTIQ plus people and how they navigate their lives. But I take a special interest in, in looking at the intersection of gender, sexuality and, and faith. So my main theme for all these years has been on looking at how people of diverse genders, sexes and sexualities have been able to navigate not just their everyday lives, but also their lives in connection with their sense of spirituality, which I think is very important. One of the things that we must remember is that in Southeast Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, though not exclusively so, religion plays a very important role in shaping gender and sexuality. And in turn, gender and sexuality also play this incredibly pivotal role in shaping religion, spirituality, and ethics. So that has been my theme over the years. And, and I do enjoy this intersection immensely because um, it gives me an opportunity to look not just into people's performances of gender and sexuality, but also into their performances of spirituality. All right, moving on to our next question. What motivates you? Is there any sort of trigger for that? The School of Arts and Social Sciences has as its research strength social transformation in Southeast Asia. And when we look at the idea of social transformation, we automatically gravitate towards those who are marginalized in society. And often they're never through their own fault. They are very often people who find themselves in particular adverse situations because of their circumstances. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I realized was that, you know, there's so many different kinds, different groups of people who are marginalized in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. but there's always a kind of outreach and assistance offered to groups of people who are seen as, uh, you know, I'm using air quotes here, safe and respectable. Mm -hmm. And those who don't fit into this, this, this caricature of marginalized communities often slip through the cracks. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and all forms of queer people, non-binary people, often don't get any kind of airtime because they've been put down as being abnormal. They are pathologized, and you know, and especially from religious perspectives, they're seen as sinful and willfully sinful. Yes. You know, you know yes. what? 
the di- what you know what divine dictates are, and therefore you are transgressing these divine dictates. But from my own experiences, you know, of interviewing people and research, all forms of research on different kinds of of um, people of diverse gender, sexes, and sexualities, I find that that is not exactly the truth. Even if certain religious beliefs or philosophies have nothing against LGBTIQA plus people, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, still cultural elements are very strong. And cultural elements conspire with popular sentiment to persecute and prosecute LGBTIQA plus people. I find that a terrible injustice, you know, especially when we talk about human beings who are you know, simply trying to be who they are and to live out their lives the best they can and who believe that they are meant to be on earth as they are. So I found it really important for me, you know, for my short time on earth anyway, to reach out and to showcase their voices and to provide people with an alternative perspective and understanding of uh, people of diverse genders and sexualities. Um, so we did mention some of your research while introducing you to of your books out of an immense, immensely long list of publications. <laughs> and um, so from some of that research, what are the key findings across you know, your research on LGBTQ plus issues? Well, Avi, I did mention a while ago that um, I work at the intersection of gender, sexuality mm-hmm. and, and, and faith mm-hmm. or spirituality or religion or theology, whatever you like. Mm-hmm. And what I found you know, for the most part is that a lot of LGBTIQA plus people have been terribly wounded and injured and humiliated by religious hierarchies who have, for the most part, never actually reached out to LGBTIQA plus people and asked them about their lives and how they live their lives as queer and trans people and people of a particular faith. I think it's important for us to realize that a lot of LGBTIQA plus people are spoken for and spoken at, but rarely, if ever, spoken with. Another thing that I found out is that rather than just relinquishing their religious beliefs, uh, many LGBTIQ plus people sort of recalibrate and recast their religious beliefs according to the lines of personalized spiritualities. So you get people who turn their backs on the dogmas and the doctrines and pronouncements of religious beliefs, hierarchical religious beliefs, and say, look, you know, my mosque, my temple, my church tells me that what I'm doing is sinful and unethical and, you know, I'm going, I can expect divine punishment at the end of my life for choosing to live this particular way. And instead they say, look, this is between me and the divine. This is between me and God, you know. And this is something that is often referred to by the sociologist Andrew Yip as an ontogeneric argument, which simply says that a lot of LGBTIQA plus people ascribe their gender and sexual identities to God that God made me this way. I am who I am because God made me this way. Um, Perhaps a third thing that I've discovered also is that many LGBTIQA plus people live in constant fear and shame and have never felt, many of them, I'm not saying all of them, but many of them have never felt that they can be as good as cisgender and heteronormative people. You know, a lot of Southeast Asians who are LGBTIQ plus you know, really work to the bone, even more than uh, cisgender and heteronormative people, because of society's rejection and disapproval. And yet they discover that they can never quite reach that mark simply on the basis of their gender and sexual identities. Yes, yes. Um, I think on the third finding, I would fully agree with you that a lot of people tend to sort of compensate or wish to compensate for that sort of invisible gap that they feel, but like you mentioned, that a lot of people can switch that perspective and reconcile their religious beliefs with their sexual identities and be at peace, love themselves as they are. I I have to add, though, Avi, that this reconciliation Mm -hmm. and this peace that you talk about is so fluid Mm -hmm. and so fragile. Definitely. Uh, um, 
that one never attains 100%, you know, one never attains that 100% achievement in terms of reconciliation. Of course, For of course. every step that you take towards self-affirmation, you take three steps back. Mm. And every now and again, every now and then, you know, the specter of, of condemnation visits you. And you start thinking, you know, am I doing the right thing? Um, am I going to hell anyway? Um, is it really um, is it really wrong to be LGBTIQ plus? It must be because society says so. But I think this constant speaking back to society's presumptions and and ideas about how human beings should be, I think that is actually creating a sort of critical mass to help people think that you know to help people understand that whoa you know. What I've been taught, what I've been socialized into all this time about LGBTIQ plus people and religion, in that sense, maybe that's not exactly what it is. Maybe there's something more that I haven't thought about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for people to hear these options mm -hmm. because then they can uh, give themselves permission to think outside the box. Yes. I don't think we're in a business of brainwashing. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're in a business of giving people other ways of thinking, other ideas that they might consider. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we don't allow people, the, you know, if we don't give people the opportunity to think beyond what has always been there, what they've been, you know, constantly bombarded with in terms of what is truth, then, you know, what kind of human beings are we, are we molding, you know? What kind of society are we building mm -hmm. where everybody has to look the same, think the same, say the same thing. One step forward and three step backwards is still one slow step forward. Mm, so I agree. It may be unstable, it may be slow, but it is still steady progress. Moving on to some of the struggles that we were actually talking about, you know, how people question themselves. Um, what do you think will be the major challenges? A very, very general question. What do you think will be the major challenges faced by the LGBTQIA+. How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> yes. um, just so, gosh. It's a loaded question. I think we belong, you know, in. It, I'm going to concentrate on Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And in Southeast Asia, there are certain expectations of human beings. And these are very cisnormative and heteronormative expectations. And one of it is, you know, deals with gender roles. Mm. Um, there are certain gender expectations that are made of human beings. If you're born female, you should be a woman, you should be attracted to a man, you should have mm -hmm. children. That sort of expectation, right? Mm -hmm. When people don't, don't abide by those expectations, when they don't cohere with those expectations, then they're seen as anomalies. Mm -hmm. And anomalies are always ostracized. Mm -hmm. But people have never realized that norms are created by human beings to sustain and protect the power of a certain group of people and this power is only possible when there is sort of like an opposing force so you are only powerful when you are able to have power over the powerless yes. and so in in pronouncing certain people as 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 aberrant as you know abnormal the one who is able to make that pronouncement automatically has more power over the one who is pronounced as abnormal or an aberrant. And that is a huge problem because gender and sexuality, you know, normative forms of gender and sexuality that are buttressed by societal norms and religious norms, gender and sexuality then become tools of disempowerment. And along with that, you know, to make it simple because it's not, it's really not a simple thing at all. But, you know, it's got major repercussions. It's got m major ripple effects yeah. in terms of career advancement, respect and, and, and acceptability in society, in terms of the capacity to flourish within a particular so social context, mm -hmm. your navigation of social networks, etc. I suppose what I'm trying to say, Avi, is that LGBTIQA plus people are of course, I have to acknowledge that not all LGBTIQA plus people are the same. Mm. It's very important that we don't paint this portrait of victimhood for of course, all people of, of diverse gender sexualities. Yes. Some are given more opportunities than others. Some mm. find themselves in circumstances where 
they can really grow and thrive. But more often than not, we find LGBTIQ plus people, you know, they have the short end of the stick. They are constantly disempowered and they constantly spiral into self-loathing. And how, how do you grow as a human being if you're constantly being told that you're abnormal? When in fact, there is nothing abnormal about you. You are simply a part of human diversity. And we have to affirm that human diversity. One of the things that, and I speak for Malaysia now, one of the things that we tend to forget is that Malaysia itself was founded as a country, as a nation, on diversity. Ethnic diversity, religious diversity, yes. um, all kinds of diversity. And yet, you know, gender and sexuality have been taken out of that, that whole framework of understanding diversity in Malaysia. Of course, you also have a whole suite of secular and religious laws that continue to persecute and prosecute people throughout Southeast Asia. And, you know, sometimes laws that are only obliquely related to gender and sexuality are used willy-nilly against LGBTIQ plus people. Mm -hmm. Easy victims, right? Yes. Easy targets. Yep. And, and what happens then is that people live in fear. And when people live in fear, like I mentioned a while ago, you know, their access to society's resources become extremely limited. I'll give you two examples. One is, you know, something as simple as the toilet. When I was, you know, conducting research on trans men, mm -hmm. I found out that many trans men don't go to the toilet from morning until evening at the workplace. First of all, they don't know which one to go to, but more often than not, they're terrified of being outed if they go to the toilet of their choice. Many of them find that, uh, many of them find that, especially those who don't pass, or who don't pass completely, often get interrogated by their colleagues. So in order to avoid all that, they just, sorry for being so blunt here, keep it in. I mean, that sort of terrifying, or honestly even embarrassing sort of situation is because, you know, a lot of people, like, like you mentioned, trans people who are not fully, you know, able to pass, yes, some people may identify as trans but not necessarily have a surgery or a gender change or anything of that sort. So that doesn't mean that they should not be granted basic access. Like going to the washroom, doing your business, that is a basic human need. At least something like that should be accessible to every single living, breathing human. Just because on the basis of gender and sexuality you're made to face such problems, that is definitely not a good look on our society as a whole. Yeah, I think human beings have forgotten that life cannot be easily categorized into what is black and what is white. When people ask me what I mean by that, I say that, you know, if you can understand how black and white are, are simply part of a spectrum, a gradient, then you realize that what is between black and white are really different shades of grey. A lot of people fail to recognize that. I think adding on the point that, you know, you mentioned in the context of Southeast Asia or even Malaysia, I think just um, touching upon a little bit of some of my personal grudges from where I come from, like Thailand, um, just, just to mention it, because I was thinking about the struggles of people who just don't conform to, you know, cisgender or heteronormative identities. For example, countries like Thailand, they free ride off of the LGBTQ plus community just to, you know, raise the tourist economy and such. But then when mm -hmm. it comes to granting actual rights to the community, there's absolutely no response. So in that sense, yes, that's definitely one of the billions of examples one could give that, you know, like of the challenges that people face. Oh, this yes. This is just one small country in hundreds of countries across the world. So, yeah. yeah. If LGBTIQA plus people are not collateral damage, then it becomes fodder for, you know, boost the economy. Free marketing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> another, another example that I'd like to give is how so many, uh, especially transgender women and gay men and to a certain extent bisexual men, mm -hmm. and this is self-imposed. Maybe I should qualify what I mean by self-imposed. A lot of transgender women, mm -hmm. gay men and bisexual men especially, are really afraid to gain access to any kind of sexual health treatments because they're afraid of being outed. Mm -hmm. And by outed, uh, you know, I mean that they don't want to disclose their sexual identities. And because of that, you have people, even in this day and age, dying of AIDS, mm. which 
you know, could have been avoided. If, if it's a toss between being outed and having proper medication, people would choose to avoid being outed. So really, the preservation of gender and sexual norms is the price of human life. I think that should sink in for the listeners out there. And Avi, <sighs> what about the countless young people who are kicked out of their homes? Yes. Um, you know, I was interviewing a trans man once who very wisely said to me, the people who are supposed to have your back are the ones who actually kick you out of the house. And, and that is such a painful experience for many of them mm-hmm. who have no other recourse, you know. And what happens to human beings when they don't have the support of the ones they love the most in life? Really, you know, uh, I, think, I think people should take a good hard look at themselves yeah. and understand that diversity is just... Uh, it's just part of, of being human. So why, why do you need to be so, so, uh, so officious, you know, um, why do you have to be so? Why do you have to feel embarrassed and humiliated if your if your children are, are queer or trans? I think, you know, at the end of the day, these are your children. Exactly. Like if if your birth family doesn't support you and you basically get abandoned by the one true support system you knew since day one, that's a special kind of heartbreak. Oh, I would say. well that's said. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yet it happens. I'm in again. Yes. All right. So moving on to the next question, a little lighter than the previous question. So what is your current research project, the most recent one that you can talk about? I am currently working on transgender issues in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. I don't speak for transgender people. Mm-hmm. I think representation is important, but I believe that trans people should speak for trans people. But that does not discount the possibility of allies speaking with transgender people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I am a trans ally. I am not transgender myself, mm-hmm. but I am a transgender ally. And I believe that I am working with transgender people towards greater equality mm-hmm. and, and dignity. So I'm currently working on a research project that looks at how this transgender staffed, transgender-led community-based organization Seed Malaysia is reaching out to transgender people, the homeless, undocumented people, the aged, the ostracized, people living with HIV, people who use drugs, and the list goes on. People who, you know, have slipped through the cracks of governmental assistance. Mm -hmm. And this Seed Malaysia is unique because it is the first transgender-led organization that focuses on transgender people, but not exclusively on transgender people in in Kuala Lumpur, Mm -hmm. Malaysia. Seed Malaysia comprises a drop-in center and also a home for elderly transgender people. People tend to forget that a lot of transgender people, not all, that's important to note, not all, but (laughs) a lot of transgender people don't have access to the same resources as cisgender people. And because of that, they find themselves really, you know, not just at the margins of society, but people who are economically uh, disadvantaged. And because of that, many of them have to resort to, to perhaps like sex work mm. and have no homes. Yeah. So being transgender, they're kicked out of their homes. And then when they try to apply for jobs, many of them are turned away because of how they look. Again, I have to stress that I'm not saying that this is true of all transgender people, but I've seen many. And so the drop-in centre provides mm-hmm. sort of a refuge for them. The home for elderly transgender people is particularly important because many transgender people, especially transgender women, have no homes to go back to. And who takes care of them, you know, when they fall sick, when they get older? So this is really incredible, an honourable, a noble service to the Malaysian society. Um, So my research deals with (laughs) looking at the ins and outs of their their operations, um, their challenges, their triumphs, and also at how the pandemic has impacted uh, their day-to-day operations. I suppose what I'm trying to look at, if I may summarize this really briefly, is how people who have been rejected by society are in turn playing this important role in society by reaching out to those who are like them and those who have less than them. So I call these transgender spaces. So how are these transgender spaces expanded beyond ordinary spaces that are reserved for transgender people. How do trans people reach out to non-transgender people, for example, and use that spirit of inclusion 
you know, how do they sort of deploy that spirit of inclusion to transgender people and cisgender people, to anyone who needs help? For those who seem to shy away from, you know, being an ally, there's no point in that. There's only respect and, you know, you will earn respect if you just go out there and just say what's on your mind. That, yeah, I do support the LGBTQ community and I wish to, you know, be an advocate, be an ally. There is no shame in admitting that. Trust me. I, I think a lot of people are afraid of guilty by, of being guilty by association. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, of course, that, you know, you're stigmatized if you're queer or trans, if you're non-binary, because you, don't just, you just don't fit into the mold, right? Mm. And the last thing you want to do is to put yourself in that precarious situation where you might experience the same vulnerabilities that LGBTIQA plus people experience, you know, often on a daily basis. And there's a great deal of unnecessary shame mm. attached to that. Um, it's this really rigid system that tells us you know, erroneously that we are only somebody if we abide by normative gender and sexual norms. I was also thinking about allies, mm -hmm. and I think I, I believe in um, equality, mm -hmm. and I also believe in gender and sexuality rights for cisgender, transgender, heteronormative, non heteronormative persons. I believe in that. But sometimes what tends to happen is that people who are, you know, well-meaning people who want to strive towards that equality, uh, you know, strive towards creating that climate of equality mm -hmm. and dignity for LGBTIQ plus people tend to use terms like tolerance and sometimes compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think I would just like to remind people out there that LGBTIQA plus people don't need compassion and they don't need uh, tolerance. They just need to be seen as the, as the people whom they are. Yes. Um, yes. And I think, you know, you, you, you said one word that I really like, and that's affirmation and respect, or two words, really. <laughs> people say, it doesn't matter if you are LGBTIQ+, or if you're straight, or if you're cisgender, you're all human. I, I don't really agree with that. I think it does matter. Because when we realize that it does matter, then we begin to, begin to respect, then we begin to respect and affirm people because of their genders and sexualities, not despite of their genders and sexualities. Yes, yes, yes. I would fully, fully, fully agree on that because a lot of people tend to say, I don't care. And that is a very sort of dismissive attitude. When, when for example, when somebody comes out to a friend, uh, you know, hi, I'm bisexual, blah, 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 you're a close friend, I just wanted to confide in you. And then they go off by saying, okay, I don't care. And that's a very, I wouldn't go as far as saying disrespectful, but it's very dismissive of the journey, you know, so of the true. experiences. And I'm like, okay, maybe you could just say that, okay, I respect your journey, I'm here as a supporter. And that could be it. It doesn't have to be that, oh, I'm so nonchalant whatsoever. It doesn't have to yeah. be. <laughs> and who says that, you know, we need to agree 100% with someone in order to respect yeah, them. Yeah. Um, we, we're human beings. We will always disagree with other human beings, you know, at some point on some level. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean the respect stops there. Right. We would just like to wrap up with this, which is what message do you have for LGBTQIA plus staff and students of Monash University of Malaysia? You know, in various ways, I've, I think I've responded to that question throughout, <laughs> throughout the podcast. But, yes. but perhaps um, just, I'd just like to say that, that people will always be different from each other. And uh, people need to realize that respect, the accordance of dignity, and the sense of affirmation that we need to sort of convey to all human beings for being who they are, that should not fall short of a recognition of people's gender and sexual identities. It cuts across the board. If you respect someone for being of a particular class, of a particular ethnicity, of a particular nationality, of a particular religion, I think it's really important to extend that to gender and sexuality as well. The other thing that I would like to say is, you know, there's so many preconceived notions and assumptions about LGBTIQ plus people it's time to take a hard look at, at those assumptions and those preconceived notions. Actually, just humble oneself 
and ask LGBTIQ plus people how they live their lives. Mm -hmm. They might not necessarily tell you all the deepest, darkest <laughs> secrets, but I think... You know, we c we can learn from each other. So what what is it that we can learn from each other? Rather than dismissing people and condemning them, why don't we learn from each other? I think LGBTIQ plus people are often considered not just sinful, but people who live really abnormal lives mm. and do all kinds of have strange sexual habits and oh gosh, you know, a, a thousand and one other things that may be true for certain people, but cannot be a generalized concept that is imposed on all LGBTQ plus people. I think we have much to learn from each other. I think this aligns really well with the Monash slogan, I'd say. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it in Latin, but I think all of you know exactly what it is. Ancora Imparo. There we go. Ancora Imparo, yes, I that's the school. Learning. That's the university motto, yes. Yeah, and I think it really, really aligns really well with that. That, you know, we're all still learning. And like Dr. Joseph just said, we can maybe just humble ourselves, take a step back and take a good look. And try to relearn a few more things. Yes, okay, so that will be the end of today's podcast. I would like to thank Dr. Joseph. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this was a really interesting chat, and I really hope that our listeners have learned something today, something valuable that they can take with them for the rest of their days ahead. And, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to apply anything. Just maybe be a more respectful human being, be more loving that way we can all, one by one, make the world a better place. Or at least Malaysia a better place. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avi.